coming out tonight. Uh, so before we get started, I just want to tell you a couple of our upcoming programs. We always have a busy month ahead of us. So uh, next up, starting on March 15th and running until the 27th, we have our annual book sale. And that's going to take place literally right here. Um, and all sales are by donation, so definitely come out and check it out. We've got books, DVDs, children's books. Um, so come see us. And also coming up on Tuesday, March 19th at 6 p.m., uh, Dr. Michael Schroeder is going to be joining us. And he is doing a program that's called Cryptanalysis in Classic Literature. And what that is, is he's going to be talking about deciphering coded messages in five classic short stories. Um, so if you're interested in code breaking at all, um, definitely come check that out. And then also on Saturday, March 23rd from 11.30 to 12.30, uh, Carolyn and Jeremy, who you may have seen around Christmas time here, they will be here playing uh, the piano and clarinet, or the keyboard and clarinet. And they're going to be playing just, you know, nice classical music for about an hour here in the library on a Saturday. So you can come enjoy, or you can just enjoy listening for a book while nice music plays. So um, that, again, is on Saturday, March 23rd. And also I want to mention we do have a relatively new program started here called uh, Social Seniors. And that's every Wednesday from 10.30 to 11.30. If you see our puzzle over there that was just completed, um, that's something they've been working on for the past few weeks. So you can come out for puzzles, for games, for conversation. And that's every single Wednesday. Uh, so tonight we have uh, Vincent Sirisol here, and he is a master gardener from Rochester. And he's going to be talking about his book, How to Grow a Vegetable Garden That Cannot Fail. So I will pass it over to Vincent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elena. Oh, thank you, thank you, folks. Listen, the first thing I want to do before we start is uh, I'd like to bow our heads for a moment to respect and remember Captain Joel Barnes, who recently passed in service, died in service. Thank you. Uh, my name is Vincent Sarasol. Uh, <coughs> I live in Rochester for the past six years. I used to tell people I'm from Rochester, but the minute I said that, they would come back at me and say, you're not from Rochester. <laughs> <laughs> so I gave up on it. A while back, I made a phone call to a fellow in Chicago, business call, and uh, he says, hello, this is Vincent Sirosol. I'm calling from New York. He says, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I must be something, <laughs> there must be something to it. Uh, <clears throat> just to tell you a little bit about my background, um, uh, in, in the gardening part, about 15 or 20 years ago, I began to be interested in organic gardening. I was in a different field to earn my living, but I got enthralled with organic gardening, um, went, to, went to classes and became a master gardener, and gradually phased out of my old job and phased into organic farming or on a small scale or uh, in my case an organic garden. My garden was a commercial garden. I sold my vegetables at two farmers markets and at a farm stand. The garden measured 100 feet across and 160 feet deep. So it was a 16,000 square foot organic garden everything organic. And I had that garden and did that joyful work for 13 years. And that's the garden that I left six years ago when I came to New Hampshire. And now I live in a condo and I don't do gardening anymore. Uh, I do a couple of related things. Uh, while I was gardening, farming, I put together a course in, 
organic gardening skills and techniques, and problems with industrial agriculture. And it's a six-hour course that I teach in two-hour segments, of two hours a week for three weeks. And as a part of that course, I show a film entitled What Plants Talk About, and it's a, a NPR nature series film. It does a lot, something similar in some ways to what I tried to do in my book. <coughs> and I taught for the, that course for the past 11 years on Long Island and here in, in New England. I've taught at most of the libraries around, including this one. I've taught at a couple of health food stores. I taught at Dover Adult Education. I, I, I've taught my course at a lot of places. Uh, and I'm scheduled once again this year to be teaching that course. I must have taught over the years hundreds of adults. Very enjoyable, very satisfactory, and I think very constructively. I got a lot of positive feedback, so I'm glad that it works. <clears throat> Um, so I told you something on my training, my practical experience, and coming to New Hampshire. I, I moved into a condo for the first time. Um, I stopped gardening pretty much altogether. I stopped doing actual gardening work, but I continue to do courses. I continue to study about organic gardening. I'm an activist and an advocate for organic gardening, and that's what I'm doing here tonight. I want to convince you all to become avid organic gardeners and to turn your back on the industrial system that you see in all the food stores. Uh, <coughs> and uh, I also wrote a book. And I wrote a book entitled how to grow a vegetable garden that cannot fail. And I insist that your garden cannot fail if you simply do the things that the plants require. And this book is an attempt to introduce you to plants. What they are, where they live, what they need, how, they, how to take care of them, how to handle problems with plants, and so forth. I intend this to be the background so you get an understanding of what you're doing in the garden. The second volume that will be coming out as soon as possible, I don't exactly know when, I call it uh, Getting Dirty with Your Plants in the Garden. And it's a book on practical installation of plants in the ground. H how you plant them, when you plant them, where you plant them, seeds versus transplants, uh, how you take care of them, what you need to do to maintain them, to maintain the garden, to keep the plants healthy, and so forth. I have some innovative design plans in that second volume. For instance, I'll tell you a little story. Uh, I, I, my grandpa had a garden. My dad had a garden. I had a garden all, all, my, all our lives. And <clears throat> we always planted vegetables. And then somebody came along and said something about, well, you know, do you ever try flowers? And I said, no, I don't like flowers. I, I like vegetables. Well, no, I, I got a vegetable garden. And then somehow it came up again, and somehow it came up again, and I said, you know, what's going on with these flowers? I don't know the first thing about flowers. So I said, I'm going to try something. So I got a flower catalog, and I bought every flower in the catalog, about 50 flowers. And I stuck them all over my garden, every place. Every place you could, there was a hole I put a flower in. And I said, let's see what happens. How bad could it be? 
Well, when those flowers grew, some of them viney to climb up my trellis, where I had the veggies on, some of them low growing, all of them colored. I said, oh my God, I created a Garden of Eden. <laughs> this place is like paradise. Why didn't I ever do this before? <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> the recommendation I make in planting and laying out your garden design involves planting vegetables which are compatible. You call them companion plants, including herbs which support those plants, and including flowers with the herbs and the vegetables for pollination purposes and for other purposes as well as aesthetic. So now, am I a vegetable gardener? I guess, but uh, among other things, not exclusively anymore. <clears throat> no, no offense to dad and grandpa. Uh, <clears throat> Any questions so far? Does that book have a list of companion plants that should be It sure does. Together? This volume has. Yeah, I'm going to go through this book with you tonight. Uh, other questions? The idea of this book is to introduce you to plants, to familiarize you with what they are, how they grow, what they need, where they live, and so on. What are the conditions in which plants thrive? And how, as a gardener, can you create those conditions to have vigorous, healthy, robust plants which don't get diseased and which are not attacked by insects? This works very much the same as people. The plants are the same as people in this regard. Some of us are quite robust, healthy, hardy, and don't seem to get sick very often, rarely get sick. And then others of us are a little bit more delicate, a little frail, and succumb to problems, health problems, a little more readily. And that's exactly the way things work with plants. And what I'd say in my book, and what I'm trying to encourage you this evening, try to grow healthy, robust, dynamic, productive plants, which will not be attacked by insects, and which will be more hardy and able to resist diseases. If you succeed in that, now you don't need any of the poisons. You don't need to kill anything because nothing is there. Very heavy duty, hardy plants, vegetable plants have a thick cell wall. Many insects are rather primitive and have a very basic digestive system. And when they get to those hardy plants, they won't even eat them because they can't digest that stuff. So they go naturally other places. They leave your hardy, strong plants. And conversely, if the plants are a little bit stressed, they get attacked. So it's very much a positive, a very much a proactive thing. The idea that I'm talking about tonight and the idea that I have presented in this volume is grow healthy, hardy plants. And this is the definition of what healthy, hardy mean and how you get there. I want to show you the way the book is laid out. First part, <clears throat> every chapter has a title page with a picture of my garden. Then it has an introductory page, which tells you five or six different articles 
that I have culled from the world. Every time I come across a very appropriate or a good article, I hold on to it. And some, most of the times I edit them and I put them in the book for people's information. So I've sort of consolidated things into one book for you. Many of the articles in this book I've written myself based on my own experience and my own uh, techniques and my own knowledge and skills. Other stuff, people bring insights that I'm, I don't have and I don't, I'm not aware of, but I think they're valuable, so I include them in my book. Then I proceed to give you the articles which contain not only specific articles, but I've given you in this, this book has six chapters. In three chapters, I've given you interviews with noted agriculturists. Are, are any of you familiar with Dr. John Mercola? He's a, he's a holistic, he's a physician, and he's a holistic physician, and his emphasis is on building up yourself, building people up so they're strong and they don't get sick. So he's all about positive uh, uh, building up people rather than curing people who have illnesses. He's interviewed three different agriculture experts and I've given you the interview here. Each, each expert has a point of view about, they're all organic, and I have a point of view about what's important and why it's important. And just reading the conversation is very illuminating. You'll, you'll enjoy every one of them, I'm sure. And you'll learn a lot from them. They're good people. Uh, <clears throat> a lady asked about companion plants. Uh, this first chapter, which was called, this is the second chapter. See, it's election. This is the second chapter, which is called, I keep saying that because I don't know what it's called. <laughs> second chapter is called, Multi-cropping. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna run through the titles of the six chapters with you, just to give you a feel for the book, and then I'll go down to each chapter. Uh, the first chapter in the book is called Seed Considerations. There are a few different types of seeds. There are different ways of planting different seeds. Believe it or not, some seeds need to be exposed to the sun in order to germinate. Uh, there are uh, uh, hybrid seeds and, and uh, heirloom seeds and genetically modified seeds, uh, all different. So this first chapter deals with seeds, what they are, how to work with them. Second chapter is called multi-cropping. The idea of multi-cropping is the exact opposite of what the industrial agriculturists do. Industrial agriculture plants 100 acres of corn and nothing but corn and invents machines which are able to very efficiently work those 100 acres. And that's called monocropping, one crop. That is a tremendously artificial and unnatural way for plants to grow. Never in any location in nature will you see, in undisturbed nature, will you see only one type of plant growing, only. Nature always mixes up the plants, all different kind of plants. Each plant supports the other in a different way, in some way or another. That's what makes a healthy plant scape. For instance, the story uh, I've heard is when the pioneers went out west in the United States, they ha there was existing the prairie, 
where the buffalo were and these big tall grasses grew. And <clears throat> the, the early farmers had great difficulty getting the plows to cut through the roots, the root system of all the plants that had been living there for God knows how long. So the prairie was thriving with a mixture of all different kind of plants. That's what they discovered. And that's the opposite of what the industrial agriculturists do. They go for industrial efficiency. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, to the detriment of the plants, the plants they're planting suffer from that kind of an environment because they're, vic they're vulnerable to insect attack. If, if you find an, if you grow corn and you find an insect comes along that likes corn, well, you give him a hundred acres mm -hmm. and he thinks he died and went to heaven and he's going to call his brother and his sister and his father and his mother and his aunt Tilly and they're all going to come and feast on these, all of this corn that we got. And of course, the planter of the corn, the farmer, can't allow that to happen. So he resorts to poisoning them. I'm going to kill all of these bugs. And he succeeds at that. And in the process, he poisons the plants also, which we eat. And he poisons the soil, which is full of living creatures and he kills those also so this industrial agriculture system that we've developed has an incredible efficiency at producing volume of of a crop but it has tremendous side effects which are, are harmful to human beings are harmful to the world so that's what organic agriculture is all about. How do we get good, healthy plants that we can eat the food, nutritious, delicious food, without poisoning ourselves? Are any of you familiar with a, a woman named uh, Dr. Jane Goodall? She's a woman who works with gorillas. Her profound statement how did we get to the point of thinking that growing our plants in poison is a good idea and that says it all this is a mistake this is a stupid thing and we pay the price for it I, I don't want to get bogged down in it but we'll we might return to that. Uh, third chapter is called crop rotation. Crop rotation, simply you don't want to plant the same crop in the same place year after year after year. Why not? Who knows why not? Exactly. Plants draw out certain nutrients from the soil and if you keep planting the same crop the same nutrients get drawn out until the soil gets exhausted over a period of years. And the way you avoid that is just to move them around. And I, I give you some suggested crop rotation plants in the book. You could rotate A, B, C, and so on and so forth. It's laid out. Soil, uh, chapter 4 is soil amendments and soil chemistry. And that talks about uh, things you, you, uh, it talks about number one, the necessity of having robust, strong, healthy, living soil in order to support the plants. And I show you the relationship between the plants and the way they live and the insects and microbes that are in the soil and the way they live and how each one helps the other. The plants exude secretions from their roots, which becomes food for the microbes in the soil. And the microbes in the soil, particularly the hyphae, the fungi, microrhizobial fungi, if you want to get technical, extend out 
much, much further than the plant roots are able to extend because they're microscopic. The plant roots are too big. And these mycorrhizobial fungi bring nutrients from all over back to the plant, and the plant absorbs those nutrients through, through its roots. So the soil life supports the plants. The plants support the soil life. You lose all of that when you put the poisons down. Uh, <clears throat> there are a few, a few uh, things that I don't want to talk about in detail, but I just want to mention to you. As far as the amendments go, I'll, I'll, I'll go through. I'll just list them. Uh, manure is a great, great amendment. You have to be careful with with manure. You need to use aged manure or composted manure because fresh manure can cause disease. So you have to be careful with it. You need it. I'm really strongly recommending you use it, but use the right stuff. Use a composted if you want to buy it in a bag. If you buy it from the farmer, just ask them, where's the old manure? You know, they make the pile of manure. You say, oh, yeah, two years ago we started over there, and that's the old stuff, and now it's got fresher and fresher. So go to the old stuff. That's really important with, with manure. Uh, just to continue on that point, the way you get sick, the way manure makes you sick, is if the fruit that you eat, the fruit on, on the vegetable, the, if it touches the manure, that's what enables the disease organism to go from the manure into the fr fruit or vegetable that you eat. So you have to be careful about that. That's the point of the aged or composted manure. So those microorganisms that were in the manure are dead. They're not there anymore. <clears throat> Another excellent soil amendment is peat moss. Peat moss is food for the microorganisms. It's also a soil conditioner. It, ho it holds water. It, bre it breaks up compacted clay. It um, uh, it, 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 it firms up sandy soil, so it's a, it's a very good soil amendment. Compost. You can make compost yourself. I go in detail in the book on how to do it. And uh, excellent, excellent soil amendment, and you make it yourself, it doesn't cost you anything. When I teach my class, I go through a whole ceremony of how to do it, but I'm not going to do that now. <laughs> Start by taking some vegetable scraps and throw them on the ground. <laughs> uh, you need something from the sea. The sea, it, things from the sea are wonderful amendments to the soil. Um, the Indian people used to go to the beaches and take the seaweed, especially the thin, narrow one they call eelgrass. Take that seaweed and put on the garden. I still did that when we had the beaches on Long Island where I used to live. And I know a number of other friends who did the same thing. And I know people up here go down there, although I, I understand there are some kind of regulations here about that stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't know what those regs are. It's not in my book. But the, the, the desirability of the eelgrass is in my book. In addition to eelgrass, a, sub, a second really good substance from the sea is a form of seaweed called kelp. Kelp is a seaweed. And it's processed. They, they dry it, they grind it up, and you buy it in a powder form. It's full of nutrients that are wonderful for the soil and for the plants. Depending on, there, there's something relatively new. <clears throat> a soil amendment which was discovered down in South America along the banks of the Amazon River. It's called biochar. 
black earth. It seems the land in that part of the world is sort of the color of our skin, a little, a little brownish. Well, when people were going down there, they all of a sudden would find patches of black earth. Black. And uh, where did, what is it? Where does it come from? Why is it here? And so forth. So, make a long story short, they, they found it all over the place, here, here, there, in patches. And they analyzed it. It ends up being uh, high, high carbon based on uh, dead plant material and and burned uh, debris, the uh, leftover debris from fires, that the original people who lived there just used as more or less a dump. And these patches of brown earth, uh, black earth, they found six feet deep, wide across, and they've discovered that this stuff is very nourishing to soil. And it took time from about 1900 to about 1910 or so for, for them to get a handle on this stuff. And now it, it, they have a product called biochar, which is available. You can buy biochar as a soil amendment, and it has my strongest recommendation. It's really, really good. It has... It has um, Ay, 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 I talk so much. It has uh, little tunnels where the microscopic organisms can live. And it also it, it itself is a very nutritious carbon substance. So biochar is another good soil amendment. And depending on the soil test, which is something you should do every autumn, have the soil tested chemically. You can't do it yourself. You need a laboratory to do it. UNH does it. University of Maine does it. Vermont does it. Cornell University here in New York has a, a big, highly specialized soil testing system. The local, the, the one, they all, the basic thing is like about $20 or something like that to have a soil test. The super soil test that they do at Cornell is like $150. But it's, it's only practical for commercial growers. I don't, I don't think it makes any sense for, for us to get involved in it. It, it. Way overkill. So those are your soil amendments. And that's on chapter 4. And chapter 5 talks about composting. I, I mentioned to you composting is something you can do yourself. Take leftover kitchen scraps, take plant material, leaves, dead plant material, peat moss, mix them together. Over time they deteriorate and the vegetable scraps disappear. Peat moss disappeared, compost, if you want to throw some other compost in, disappears. And what you get instead of those raw materials is this fine black granular powder called, that we call compost. Okay, it's really nutritious, it's really worthwhile, it's really nourishing and valuable to the plants as well as to the organisms that live in the soil. So, I have a whole chapter about composting. Lots of references, lots of resources. <clears throat> the thing I, I, I'm jumping around here, but the thing I didn't show you when I tried to introduce you to the way I laid the book out starts with a, a, a picture at the start of the chapter and then a statement, uh, a, a listing of the different articles in the chapter and then at the end crop rotation additional resources. So if you want to get more involved in crop rotation for whatever reason I give you eight or nine different sources of information. They're not in my book 
but there, I want to make them available to you if, if you feel an interest and a need. So that's the way the book is laid out in every chapter. First the picture, then the list of articles, and then the articles themselves, and then the list of additional resources if you want to go further. <clears throat> the last chapter in the book is cover cropping. Here again, you know, we, we weren't really bad gardeners, my grandpa and my dad and I, but at the end of the year, at the end of the gardening season, we were fastidious about cleaning up all the debris and looked with pride on our nice, clean ground where the plants used to be. It ends up that that was sort of a, a bad idea. It was a great idea to clean, do the cleanup, but it was a bad idea to leave the ground naked. And if you think about it, we should have figured it out for ourselves because where in nature do you ever see bare, naked ground? Desert. Only where something is wrong, like a desert or a beach or, an, or, 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 or a chemical stain. Otherwise, the ground is always covered with something growing. Plants, trees, weeds, whatever you want to call them. Well, that's what we missed out in our gardens. All summer long, our vegetables were sucking nutrients out of the soil. When you plant a cover crop at the end of the season, after you, after you clean up the debris, plant some grass, plant some legumes, and let them grow all winter long. The legumes will bring nitrogen from the atmosphere into the soil. Nitrogen is fertilizer, so you're bringing fertilizer into the soil. The grasses will bring biomass. What you're going to do with that cover crop, which could get this high, over the winter, is you're going to chop it down. You're going to chop all the cover crop down. When the, when the legumes flower, that's when the nitrogen is going in. Chop all, the, chop all the cover crop down and grind it in with a rototiller or a pitchfork if you only have a small garden. But take all of that, what used to be growing all, all, see, all winter season long, put it back into the soil it will be decomposed by the soil microorganisms and it will be plant food for, for your desirable vegetables. So the garden really is a 12 month a year project. And that's the way it works. I still have a few more, uh, I still have a few more minutes. Okay, I've given it a six different procedures, and I, I call them by chapter names. What are they? <laughs> Seeds. What? Seeds. Seeds. Compost. Composting. Rotation. Crop rotation. Cover crop. Cover cropping. Multi cropping. What is multi cropping? Can plant a lot of different plants in your garden. Don't don't, don't just plant one <laughs> one. Sorry. Don't just have a tomato plant garden. <laughs> okay, and flowers yeah. Yeah. and herbs. Uh, which one did we leave out? Oh, you left out soil amendments. Yeah, so you have to amend the soil. I had my garden going for 13 years, and I did exactly this stuff. Exactly this, religiously. Over time, the soil in my garden rose up about a foot. When you go into my garden, you had to step up into it. <laughs> and when you stepped up into it, you felt like you were walking on marshmallows. It was so delicate and made such plants. I, I show you. 
when I teach my class, I pass out pictures of my garden. I mean, my, my tomatoes and pole beans and um, six feet high on a trellis this high, all the way down 160 feet, hundreds of tomato plants and other things. It was, it was spectacular. And it all came from the soil. That's, that's what made it happen. Is that card still being used by... I, I have no idea. I, I, I left. I left with a very heavy heart. And I said, I'm never going to go back there. Because if that place is spoiled, I think I would die. It was, it was a spectacle. It was a really, really... Well, I shouldn't talk that way. But. <laughs> It was pretty cool, and it meant a great deal to me. And leaving it was heartbreaking. That was really the most unpleasant part of leaving Long Island was leaving my garden. Thank goodness my wife came with me. <laughs> Speaking of my wife, she, she's a great gal, you know, our, our story. I, I met her when she was 15 years old. I married her when she was 18. When she was 21, she had three babies. When she was 39, her kids were all grown and out of the house. Wow. So that's our story, <laughs> in a nutshell. So anyway, she, she, she's such a dear. A uh, number of years back, when I went to the Social Security office, you know those bums? <laughs> they made me open up my shirt, show them the gray hairs on my chest before they would give me a pension. <laughs> I came home, I told my wife, she says, you're so stupid. You should have dropped your shorts. They would have given you a disability. <laughs> <laughs> See what I have to put up with? <laughs> hey, yeah, yeah. When I die, I'm going to go straight to heaven. <laughs> God the Father is going to say, come here, Vincent, come sit at my right-hand side, the seat of honor that you earned for putting about that woman for a lifetime, a whole lifetime. <laughs> okay, so anybody have any questions? you have any questions about my book? you have any questions about the process of plants or planting as we've just skimmed over it? I have a question. Where do you buy your food now? You don't grow it any longer and you want organic. Do you go to the farmer's markets? There's a story behind that question. Oh, dear. <laughs> I don't have to drop my shorts, do I? I'm an, <laughs> I'm, an, I'm an Italian man, and I grew up in a typical, stereotypical Italian culture. And we ate the most delicious food that you could ever imagine on a daily basis. And that was ordinary. I got to be 250 pounds. And I said, oh my God, this is ridiculous because this is never going to stop. So I said, I have to stop eating like this. And I did a very difficult thing, which is I completely walked away from my heritage. And I just stopped eating that way, and my wife stopped cooking that way. And now I weigh 200 pounds, and I still got a little too much fat in my belly that I'm going to get rid of. But I eat mostly vegetables now, not because I'm a vegetarian, but just because that's what you eat if you don't want to get fat. <laughs> So I eat vegetables. And I eat most of my vegetables raw. I take every kind of vegetable, broccoli, cauliflower, kale, spinach, dandelions, all of the lettuces, and I chop them up, and that's my salad. And I eat a gigantic bowl of that. And uh, I, I get good nourishment, and, and I don't put on weight. I lose weight. Now and then I have meat, feel like a hamburger or something else, or dish a pasta once in a while. but. Not the way it used to be. That's what got me so fat, so I, I had to stop that. 
So that's my tale of woe. But uh, well, somebody asked me about, how did I get to be bobbling about my diet? Where do you buy your vegetables? Yeah, we oh, where do I buy them? Yeah. Uh, we shop a lot at Market Basket. I buy some uh, vegetables that are kind of hard to find at Trader Joe's. Uh, I try to buy organic. We, we spend extra money for the organic vegetables as much as we can. We can't buy 100% everything organic just because I can't afford it, but we buy as much as we can organic, and most of the stuff that I eat is organic. Uh, What? We go to farmer's market. Oh, yeah, we go to farmer's the market. I forgot. Crop. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Tender crop down there in Dover. We have our winter's farmer's market on Sunday. Yeah, it's on Sunday. I have it in my, in my calendar. <laughs> I have no to. I'm going to try to get there. Oh, good. Is there a reason why you would only test the soil in the autumn? I mean, is it worthwhile to test it in the spring, or do they not do testing in the spring? Uh, uh, they do testing in the spring, and lots of people test the garden in the spring, but it's my opinion that at the end of the season, the damage has been done to the soil from your garden. So let's see what it looks like now. So and then, and then you'll, now. you'll know what you have to do to build it up with your cover crop and your soil amendments yeah. for next year's garden. So we could test when our gardens thaw out, because I'm sure they're all sure. rock hard. Sure, sure you could. Now, no, you can't go down. And as necessary. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And, and uh, I don't know if I mentioned, I, I started talking about it, soil re test results, but the question of the acidity of the soil, okay. that's really important. Different plants need different level of acid in the soil. Mm -hmm. Blueberries and rhododendron azaleas and those things, evergreens, they need soil that's quite acid. Most vegetables don't like that much acid. They want the soil a little more neutral. And the way you control that is with a simple soil test that measures the acidity. And if your soil is too acid, which it most likely is because that happens naturally around here, you add lime. Lime reduces the acidity in the soil. Some people use wood chips. Wood chips contain lime. You have to be careful, uh, uh, not wood chips, uh, wood ash mm -hmm. contains lime and it neutralizes acid just like lime does. You just have to be careful with potassium because wood ash contains a lot of potassium. So you don't want to end up with wood ash potassium plus other potassium and have too much potassium. So that's what you have to watch out for with wood ash. So if you have a raised garden bed or three, would you test each one independently? Yes, okay. and I'd mark it. Okay. Bed number one, bed number two. That's what I used to do with my garden. I broke it into sections. Uh, <clears throat> I was talking about that. Soil testing and So I, I think I answered your question, but my recommendation is test in the fall, okay. although you can test in the spring, yep. and you should test in the spring if you have not tested in the fall, because that's your, your roadmap, that's your guidance as to what you have to do to the soil to make it better for your, for your plants. More? I have more. <laughs> do you, um, would you recommend planting seeds or starting seeds? indoors, planting seedlings, how, what do you recommend? Both. Okay. Both. I, I used to do both. First chapter in the book, the seed chapter, I'll, I'll give you a little tease. Sounds like I need to read the book. Give you a little, no, I'll give you a little <laughs> tease because <laughs> I, I'm trying to answer your question. Here are the seeds that I started in, oh in my, my greenhouse. Wow. You had a greenhouse? Yeah. Wow. That's pretty expensive. <laughs> That's incredible. So, you know, I, I really yeah. believe in starting from starting. Se starting seeds. Our growing season and then a lot of my vegetables, I planted the seeds. 
when I would plant peas very early in the spring, I always planted, just stuck it in with my finger. Uh, all the beans, I plant the seeds. You know, uh, lettuce and spinach, I plant the seeds. The lettuce I just broadcast like that, throw it all over the place. The seeds are so tiny. Uh, so, so the answer to your question is both. Different vegetables planted different ways. Did you have a problem with deer? Right. No, Any no, I, I, lived, I lived in a suburban place. So the houses were closer than they are around here. Mm -hmm. You know, there was like my, my property, for instance, where I was able to make the garden, my property was 50 feet wide and 400 feet deep. So that's how I had a, was able to get a big backyard. Plus, my neighbor had the same property and he never went back there. So I said, hey, David, you don't do anything back here. I said, would you mind if I put a few plants in, in your, on your property? He said, Vincent, you cut my grass. You take away my snow. I don't give a damn what you do back there. <laughs> so I did for years. I took over his whole thing. That's how the garden got to be 100 feet wide and 160 feet deep all the way in the back. When we first moved there, my wife saw the backyard and made a comment. Oh man, this would be so nice. We could have a nice swimming pool back here. <laughs> uh, and I did not respond <laughs> because I had already decided that I was going to make a garden back there. <laughs> if anybody wants to buy my book, my lovely wife is selling it there. It costs $25. If you want to get in touch with me or to keep in touch with me or to for me to get in touch with you, or if you want to attend my six-hour course, all the, li the libraries that are giving it, give it for free, just sign on the sign-up sheet, and we can keep in touch. Uh, okay, what else? What type of lime do you use? Do you use a powered lime or a time-release lime? What do you like? No. No. Lime comes in three flavors. It's all the same substance, but it's ground up very fine to a powder, almost like, uh, I don't know, do the girls still use a powder on makeup? <laughs> that fine, fine stuff. There's another kind of, of, of size, granular, a little larger, sort of like salt, that size. And then there's another kind where they take the granule and they wrap it, they encase it in a case so it will not all break down too quickly. It lasts longer. Okay. I don't use the powdered lime because it, can't, it does not fall through the spreader. You put it there and it's, boom, it just stays there. It doesn't move. So I, I ignore that. I use the granular limestone and, and I broadcast it. You know, I put it in a five-gallon bucket and I just broadcast it all over the garden like that. And at the end of the couple of passes that I make, you know, I'm all white. My shoes are all white. I'm all white. I'm eating the stuff. <laughs> Uh, but that's the way I use to work with the time. And I don't use that time release stuff. I think personally, I think it's just a gimmick. I don't see any okay. reason for it or justification for it. We do have a lot of deer. Yeah. Uh, we feed them because we like them. And they hang around. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. We had 10 deer this morning. <laughs> So well, that, that is pretty nice. I can see that, but I wouldn't try to raise vegetables <laughs> <laughs> or flowers that even. Flowers. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I do, I do uh, with the raised beds, I do put uh, fencing, fencing around, around it. Does it work? Pretty much until it's, they get it's not, to not the top. It's not solid fencing. It's you know, open enough. Keeps the deer away, but no, that's what I mean. Does it keep, is it effective in keeping the deer oh, out? Yeah, okay. Oh yeah, okay. So that's that's all that matters. The friends I have, you know, the guys on the farms, they got these ten foot high fences all around the place because yeah. the deer the deer get in there. Right. 
you know. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Glad to have met you. It's my pleasure. It's my pleasure to be here. I hope that you folks enjoyed it and get some benefit out of it. Thank you.